Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist, and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning, where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. An avid cyclist dreams of turning his passion into a business. He consults his banker to help find the best path. Now bike wheels are being built, and all it took was a little push to get rolling. First Horizon Bank. Let's find a way. Go to firsthorizon.com slash Clint. Stove Leg Media. Igniting conversation. Hey guys, what is poppin'? It's me, your girl, your host, Elena Grace, and I am bringing you a special episode this week with my friend Sydney. Hey guys. And we are going to be doing a little Pride Month special um, where I tell Sydney um, basically fun facts about... um, like queer people through history and she reacts because some of them are people that you probably know about and some of them are people that I don't think you know about or maybe I just missed it I don't know but y'all know I love a fun fact so here we are so um before we get started Sydney I would love for you to introduce yourself Just tell us, like, who you are, what you can tell us how you and I met, um, and maybe a little bit about your journey, if you want to share any of that to, like, realizing who you were and all of that. Perfect. Okay. Well, my name is Sydney. Um, Elena and I met, actually, at Eastern Kentucky University. Um, They... I guess my ex-husband and Elena kind of had some mutual friends and um, we met that way. Mm -hmm. So I for sure count that as a blessing. Um, (laughs) I guess my identity um, has been an extremely long road as I feel many people um, have that experience as well. But I came out as being gay last year, um, at the very end of June and pride month, um, I felt that was only appropriate. Um, so I guess in saying that I spent the first 27 years of my life living kind of outside of my identity as a cis straight woman. Um, I was with my ex-husband for nine years. We were married for three. And then finally, I was like, I I can't pretend anymore. I can't do this anymore. I actually ended up staying in a mental health facility for um, my mental health because it had just deteriorated, you know, trying to put up this, this front and this show of, you know, this is who I feel like I have to be. And I was forcing myself to be something that I wasn't and I wasn't living my true self and my, you know true identity. Um, so then after that, I was, I I thought, you know, I can't live this way anymore. And I really have to embrace who I am and not be afraid to step out of what I know and be who I am. So now I am, um, in a relationship with somebody that I love very dearly. And, um, she's been, 
monumental in my healing and my growth as a person and just, you know, um, helping me move forward from a part of life that I felt like I would never heal from. So it's been, it's been tough, but at the same time, it's been really incredible. It's been really incredible watching you grow, like as your friend, um, just seeing the things that you've been through and experienced over the past few years, I would say, but specifically since last June, like the things that you've the the way that you've kind of glowed up honestly like thank you I you're welcome <laughs> like just watching you come into yourself and but still being very open and honest about the things that you've had to deal with and the shortcomings and you know all of that put together it's just been really cool to watch your journey and I'm really Thanks. proud of you <laughs> oh thank you you're so welcome well I love that you brought up um like learning or no what was I gonna say I lost my words you said something about about um living outside of yourself and Oh, living like, um, like living outside of my true identity. Yeah. And then like having to step into that and kind of navigate. Yeah. I think that was it. Yeah. It feels like, <laughs> so the only thing that I can like equate it to for people. So like my girlfriend never really like in her adult life has had to deal with like that weird identity. Like, I don't know who I am sort of thing. I mean, on a, on a small scale she has, right. but, um, cause she's had, you know, her own journey and, um, you know, prior relationships and, and such. So, um, but for me, the only thing I can like equate it to is like going through puberty again. Like it's so <sighs> awkward. You don't know who you are. You're like, you, you get dressed in the morning and you're like, is this actually what I want to wear? Like you don't, it's just like, almost frustrating in a way because you're learning how to like express yourself all over again yeah you know like I mean because I I mean everything I mean down to my mannerisms and like the way I was dressing and everything else um was like solely based upon others perceptions of me and you know being this straight Christian like good to do woman and then like coming out kind of was around the same time as like the protests here in Louisville um uh -huh. you know you know centered around Black Lives Matter and all of that stuff so and I was very active in that as well so you know it kind of like zero to 60 real quick went from like oh like I'm just minding my own and trying to you know do good by by God and all these things. And then all of a sudden, you know, like I'm out in the street running from SWAT and I'm like, yeah, I'm gay. So it's just like, it was a total, <laughs> total 180 um, from what I was used to. Um, and that's kind of like the entirety of my personality now is just like social activism and yeah, I'm gay. Like it's, that's, that's it. Well, it's awesome. I think that you found yourself and you have found that this big part of yourself is serving others and helping others and making the world a better place. I agree. It's, um, you know, I always felt I had to do that, like, through my, you know, my profession and through my work. And it, it feels a lot better feeling like I can step out of that in my profession and just do that in my personal life. Um, I, yeah. It feels a lot more meaningful and it feels so much more personal um that way yeah that's really awesome well I I mean again I'm just super proud of you and like you learning who you are um and I think that there's a few of the people on this list that you might relate to um and I also think that some of the people on this list, like you'll relate to them having to kind of deal with people's perceptions um, versus being able to actually be themselves 
for sure. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, let's okay, go. Let's go. Okay, so number one on the list, Sally Ride. She was an American physicist and astronaut, and she was the first American woman in space. I just thought it was really fitting for her to be the first on the list because she's super cool. Um, but she was actually not openly gay throughout her life and career um, to the point that it was documented. Um, so after she left NASA, she taught at the University of California, San Diego. And then upon her death in 2012, her obituary revealed that she had been in a relationship with a woman for 27 years. Yeah, that feels, that feels right. That, yep. Yeah, feeling like you have to hide who you are to, you know. Yep. Um, but, hold on, let me tell you this, because this will okay. cheer you up a little bit. Her oh, sis- good, okay. Her sister, whose name is Bear, um, which is hilarious, is also a lesbian and an ordained minister, and she said that Sally not being super out of the closet was more about the fact that she's a super private person and that she's super proud of being gay. Awesome. Okay, that does make me feel <laughs> a lot better. I mean, because so many people do have to like, oh my gosh, yeah, really conceal who they are, like in their profession to avoid discrimination and you know workplace bullying and things so like but that's so good that she was just like a private person can't relate at all but um (laughs) (laughs) she's some of us are open books but um okay cool I like I like Sally and I like Bear I knew that would cheer you up yeah it does Sally and Bear seem like a cool sister pair yeah Sally and Bear that's so funny. Sally and Bear, I love it. What were I your parents thinking when they came up with these names? But I don't know. It's I have in here that they were a Norwegian family, like originally. Okay, like that was that's, their culture. That's fair. So yeah, yeah. Um. Okay. Let's see. So next is Audra Lord. So she's a black writer and civil rights activist, and. I had no idea that she was gay, but that's clearly because I'm an idiot and just completely missed it (laughs) because I think everybody else in the world knew that Um, because she very famously said, those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged in the crucibles of difference... Those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. That wow. was beautiful. That was poetic. Yeah. It, she also um, is like super well known for using her poems and prose to deal with issues related to civil rights, racism, feminism, lesbianism, capitalism, whatever isms you want to talk about, and exploring her identity. Beautiful. Did not know. I was not familiar with her prior to to this show. So um, I'll definitely be looking up her works and... yeah. Yeah, you're going to have to check her out. She's got some really beautiful stuff. Like I said, I don't know how I missed the fact that she was a lesbian. Um, Okay, are you ready for this one? This one's going to smack you in the back of the head. Leonardo da Vinci. I feel like I've heard that somewhere. It, okay, so apparently he was very, very private about his sexuality. And it's been the subject of a lot of speculation. Freud, which, you know, Freud, but he was super obsessed with the idea of his sexuality. And, you know, Freud being Freud was like, okay, yeah, he's gay, I guess, but I'm, I'm confident that he was celibate, so that means that he wasn't really gay. (laughs) <laughs> I I just throw it throw Freud away throw everything <laughs> throw it away and start over like I oh man I I don't even know what to do with that I, I know 
Freud is the hottest mess of all time, and I feel like anybody that is familiar can attest. Like, he's just... Oh, man. One of but my yeah, first... I'd, heard, I'd heard that in the past. Yeah, I hadn't heard that one. Well, apparently it's super, like, or pretty accepted at this point. And especially because there's actually a court document from 1476 when da Vinci was 24 years old that he and three other young men were charged with sodomy with a well-known male prostitute. Interesting. Yeah, the charges got dismissed, but probably because the Medici family, which was like a ruling family in um, that era of Italy... Like, one of their family members were one of the other three young men that was charged also. So they kind of helped get rid of the whole thing. But um, in his own letters, also in Da Vinci's own letters, he writes about his attraction to the opposite sex. And apparently he was also super fascinated with the idea of androgyny and transcending gender and also gender constructs. Isn't That's that really cool. Yeah. Yeah, you just I don't feel like you hear about um like different sexualities and gender constructs in history. Um I know that it's pretty openly talked about like in Native American culture, like two spirit and things like that. Yeah. But I, I didn't know of it, like, being talked about in, like, European history, so that's really cool. Right. I thought that was really neat. And he also, apparently, I have a note in here that you can see this in a handful of his works, and even some of his earlier works, where he paints angels with both masculine and feminine traits. So very androgynous, very like, is it, you know, is it one or is it the other? But it's neither. Also, why does it have to be one or the other? It's an angel. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be one or the other, but, you know. Well, it's like God has to be one or the other, but. Right. I don't. I don't get Help it. me understand. I'll never understand. But, you know, <laughs> that's <laughs> neither here nor there. No. Okay. Next on the list, Christine Jorgensen. She was the technically the world's first out transgender woman. So okay. the, the New York Daily News headline that announced her said, quote, XGI becomes blonde beauty. Operations transform Bronx youth. So before her transition, Christine was drafted into the army during World War II, um, served her time, all of that. And then a few years after the war, she traveled to Copenhagen, Denmark, to undergo reassignment operations. And she instantly became famous and was well known for her wit and advocacy. I love it. Yeah. She was uh, like a very relatable face for these kind of, I guess, newer ideas of gender issues. And she was also an actress. She worked at a nightclub and she was a lecturer and authored an autobiography. Oh my gosh. What a life. What a life. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. And I yeah. just I just love also how positive that New York news headline seems. XGI becomes blonde beauty. Like it's just it's just That's, it. It's like yes, it's so progressive compared to the time that we're in, which is <laughs> crazy i mean <laughs> since it was back you know back so far in time and yeah like, we're just slowly moving further from the light like we're just ridiculous honestly yeah okay now this is a name that you're not gonna know um more than likely her name is ala natsimova she was an actress um 
but I included her because she is credited for coming up with the phrase sewing circle. You know, how it's like, oh, me and the ladies have our sewing circle going on tonight. Yeah. You know, that was a code phrase for her and her fellow lesbian and bi Hollywood actresses. Oh my gosh, when I tell you I'm going to start using that phrase. (laughs) I believe it. (laughs) Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. (laughs) You know, I love to say weird things, so I'm just going to add this to my little pot of like weird nuances I have. It's fine. (laughs) Oh, I'm so excited. No, that just cracked me up because I was like, what? Sewing circle? Sewing circle. Oh, I'm here for gosh. it. Here for it. Okay, next. Alexander the Great. So, most historians, or pretty much all historians at this point, finally consider Alexander the Great to have been bisexual um, because he had male partners as well as female mistresses as well as queens. So his first marriage was for love and that which is sweet. And then I think she passed away and then the second and third of his marriages were political. Um so that's fun always. But Alexander was known for having some like interesting partners, male and female, but his most controversial was a young Persian eunuch named and I'm probably going to butcher this, Bagoas. And this was super controversial, though. Uh, Well, probably also because he was young, but that was kind of common back then um, up to a certain point. Like, did you know that? That, like, an older male and a younger male having a sexual relationship was common up to a certain point in, like, ancient Greece? No, the, all of this information is just absolutely rocking my world right now. Like, yeah, 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 that was like a very common thing. And it was also super common to have romantic relationships with like your best friend, like your best dude friend growing up. Like just two dudes chilling on the battlefield, one foot apart because we are kind of gay. Oh, okay. Ancient Greece. Like, I'm here for that. <laughs> But I also really appreciate the reference because I sing that all the time. And Jessica's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, I just want you to understand the reference. I just want you to understand. I do stuff like that, too. And Adam's like, Elena, I don't get that. But now he's a TikTok addict. So we'll get there. I relate. Yeah, it's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Um, but the biggest bit of controversy controversy about this young Persian boy was not that he was young it was that Alexander openly kissed him at a festival so people were like "Mm, we're seeing it out in the open and we're unsure about it so I guess my question is like you said it was common for those relationships but was it like socially accepted I don't know. I think it was socially accepted maybe, like, for, I don't know. I I don't know the details on that. I just heard a kitty cat. Yes. <laughs> it was cute. <laughs> Jess has three cats, and they are, like, running rampant right now. That one's just yelling because he's hungry. He doesn't need to eat. He's, like, 18 pounds. He doesn't, he's not hungry. But Hilarious. he just thinks he's hungry. Yeah, so he just I'm thinks sorry, he you can hear the cat. Oh, my gosh, out. no. It was... It was funny. I thought it was cute. Um, Yeah, I don't know if these relationships were, like, completely socially acceptable. I think it was up to a certain age. And then, like, you were supposed to grow out of it or something. Or you were supposed to, like, move past that. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the details. More on Alexander, though. I think you need to know this. His most prominent partner was his, quote, best friend, his, you know, gal pal, Hephaestion, whose death devastated Alexander so terribly that he threw him the world's most expensive funeral, and Hephaestion's death 
contributed to Alexander's failing mental and physical health. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And this was like, this is controversial to call this a relationship kind of amongst historians because none of their contemporaries explicitly described them as homosexual, but they were often compared to Achilles and Patroclus who were classically considered a couple. So, you know, Achilles, like Achilles Hill, the great warrior, he and Patroclus have been considered, I mean, they were, I don't know, hundreds of years old um, at the time of Alexander the Great. And at that point in time, they had been considered gay for like all of this time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just, it's a really interesting situation. But I did find that Alexander was originally from Macedonia, um, and the Macedonian court was possibly more chill with being openly gay than Greece was, like, with adult males being openly gay, right? So, like I said, it was kind of more common with young boys and, like, an older man and a younger boy. But between adult males, most Greeks were like, "Mm, you should have grown out of that by now. And in Macedonia, they think they might have been more chill with it. That just goes to show that it's like these beliefs and, you know, against homosexuality or um, any sort of curiosity or just like a social construct. Yeah. Like it's obviously like if it's accepted one place and not another and this is shown over the course of like the entirety of world history like I feel like there's not really an argument there other than like oh it's just a social construct and it's just like you're being offended for no reason you know oh for sure yeah it's just a construct it's just a cultural thing of like and I don't even know I don't I don't get it. I don't get why some cultures decide it's more or less acceptable. And especially more or less acceptable than some things that they just, like, allow to happen. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't know. Um. So, you'll know this one, probably. Alan Turing. He was a famous mathematician, and he was the key to cracking Nazi code during World War II which allowed the Allies to defeat the Nazis in many of the most crucial battles. Um, But he was convicted, even after that, even after being a key to winning World War II, he was convicted of having a relationship with a man. And because it was illegal, legally illegal, to engage in gay sex, he was, quote, punished by being chemically castrated. Okay, so we can we can <laughs> save the human race, but we can't be gay. Yeah. Am I hearing that right? Yeah. So oh my Lord. Yeah, so not long after his chemical castration, he took his own life at age forty one after using cyanide to poison an apple and he ate the apple. Oh my yeah. heart. Yeah. But not this doesn't make it better, but in 2017, um, the UK put a law in place that pardoned people, even posthumously, for their convictions of being gay, which is a little late, but, you know, it kind of, it, it was a, it was something. It was a little something. It was an effort. To it was make an it effort. Right. It didn't make it right, but it, right. Was, it was a valiant effort. Exactly. Mm. So, relatedly... Oscar Wilde, playwright, novelist, he was one of those rare authors that was wildly famous in his own time, right? Because most people are only famous, like, after they die. Um, So, at the height of his fame, he was actually put in jail for his homosexuality, and the contents of his books and plays were used against him in court as proof of his immorality. So, he was sentenced to two years hard labor, And this took, like, a really huge toll on his health. 
So afterwards, though, he reunited with his lover from before, the one whose family caused all these issues and sent him to court and all that stuff. So that's healthy. Um, (laughs) And they were reunited for a few months before their families forced them apart again, of course. Well, sadly, he died, like, not long later at 46 years old. But he was pardoned also in 2017 by the Alan Turing Law. So, posthumously pardoned. But it doesn't make up for the fact that his life was ruined by some bitter old people who didn't want their son to be gay. So, instead of destroying their own son's life, they destroyed someone else's life. Perfect. That makes perfect yeah. sense. Not that they should have destroyed their own son's life either, but they could have dealt with that with him rather than, you know, ruining someone I else. I mean, they, they could have just internalized it and not have destroyed anybody's life. That would have been probably yeah. a better course of action. Yeah. But, you know. <laughs> yeah. Here we are. You're right. <laughs> um, okay, so the mace, the mace, the most famous nurse... That there ever has been, arguably, Florence Nightingale. You've heard of her, Shut right? Shut the front door, yes. Yes. So she was, like, huge in the Crimean War in the 1850s, which is where she made a name for herself, really. And because of her heroism there, Queen Victoria granted her funding to found a hospital and a training school for nurses, which is really lit. Like, that's super cool. Um. Florence never married a man, but she was in what seems to be relationships with multiple women throughout her life, most notably her cousin, weird, but 1800s, so you got to kind of give it a little wiggle room, I guess, Um, and Florence wrote that her cousin, Marianne, was, quote, the only person that she had ever loved with any passion. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. It's That's so encouraging for me to hear because I accepted a new job today and it is in the medical field. So, wow. That's just like, I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. How like, synchronous. Yeah. I know. Wow. Yeah. I thought that was really sweet. I also thought it was cool that she was just like, chill about it she just was like i'm not gonna let society pressure me into marrying anybody i'm gonna do me i love that Mm -hmm. yeah that's a good one that is a good one um let's see oh i love this one andy warhol what yep he lived openly as a gay man before even the gay liberation movement began um and he drew a lot of his inspiration for his you know huge part in the pop art movement from underground gay culture and he liked to explore the idea of sexuality and because of this his first works that he submitted to a fine art gallery were rejected for being too gay because they were all homoerotic male nudes. Oh, well, good for him. I think, (laughs) you know, if you're going to get in trouble for anything, it should be being too gay. (laughs) So, oh my gosh, that blows my... I mean, I guess I should have, like... Expected it, maybe. Yeah, like, looking at his art and why I like... I guess maybe that's why I like his art so much is he's, like, relatable and that kind of artsy. yeah. No, I don't think I knew either that he was, like, openly gay. But when I read it, I was like, "Mm, yeah, I mean, makes sense. I'm not, I'm not shocked by this. Um, okay. You're not gonna know this woman's name probably, but you're probably gonna know who she is. Okay. Her name's Nancy Culp. You know the Beverly Hillbillies? Yeah. You know the banker's secretary, Miss Hathaway? Yeah. Her. Really? She, yep. She, and remember, she's the one that in the show is always, like, flirting with Jed and trying to, like, get with him. Yeah. yeah. She was just really, like, she was also really chill about it. So when a reporter asked her, or a 
writer, I'm not sure which, asked her about her sexual orientation, Nancy just said, quote, I find that birds of a feather flock together. That answers your question. Oh my god, that's so cute. (laughs) It is really cute. Oh, Oh, how funny. And then, okay, no surprise on this one. Freddie Mercury. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, everybody knows that. Um, In the 70s, he was in a long-term relationship with Mary Austin, um, but then after he began an affair with an American man, he told Mary about his sexuality, they ended their romantic relationships, but I do think it's super sweet that they still stayed close friends. They, like, I mean, they, he would, like, call her, and they were still connected throughout their life even after their relationship was over. Oh, so they were still besties. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of like my my ex husband and I. Like we still talk several times a week and um like he'll call me or I'll babysit our he he took our dog and I have our cat and so if like and he's a police officer so if he like works long shifts like I'll go pick up the dog and watch the dog. So Kind of the same thing. Um, yeah. Never in my life thought that I could relate to Freddie Mercury, but um, here we here are. I sit. Yeah. 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 No, I, that made me think of you when I read it just now, too. I was like, wait, that reminds me. Yeah. 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 Really cute. Um, let's see. Michelangelo. Um, like the artist, not the Ninja Turtle. Um, maybe Bo. <laughs> maybe Bo. Yeah, I don't know. I can't. I kid, I'm kidding. I can't speak for the Ninja Turtle, but I could see it. You know, down in that sewer all the time. Yeah, um, <laughs> you don't know what goes on down there. You don't know. So <laughs> lo- he's another kind of de- like kind of debatable one amongst some historians, but I think a lot of those are are just like they don't want to admit it for some weird reason. You know? I mean, I guess. What reason would there be? I don't know. I mean, just... What's the word? Being anti-gay? What's the word? Homophobic. Homophobic. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Yeah, I guess just that. Um, The University of Illinois at Springfield, they have an LGBTQ questioning and allied resource office. And they have, like, put out research, I guess, or whatever, get, and they've given the assessment basically that Michelangelo's sexuality was pretty ambiguous. There it was a lot of gossip at the time, um, but there's no clear, written, like, specific evidence that he was homosexual, but... Some people say that the physical beauty of many of his greatest works, which also happen to be male nudes, quote, gives a clear indication as to where Michelangelo's erotic interests lay. That's hilarious. I mean, yeah, but I feel like had he wanted people to know that he was gay or whatever he you know identified with um the bottom line is like kind of just it's not your damn business Um, yeah oh for sure I mean (laughs) like with Sally Ride like she was just private she didn't want people up in her business and so maybe Michelangelo didn't either I mean I'm sure because and I know that like probably a lot of you know gay people or however you may identify you know can relate to that like why are you asking me that right you know it's yeah like you don't need to it's not your business so you know good for him good for him for you know taking charge of his identity and what he will and will not talk about yeah for sure um there were some uh poems um actually sonnets you know to be precise 
that <laughs> he wrote, which, you know, that wasn't his, like, big thing. He, obviously, his big thing was painting. But he did dabble, I guess, in poetry. And there were some sonnets that were found that displayed deep feelings towards a young man from another man. Um, so, you know, it was kind of like a, a theoretical situation in the poem. Um, but the poetry was written and given to a specific young man who he and Michelangelo remained very close throughout their life. Up, well, up until Michelangelo's death. So, I would say that that gives us a little bit of a hint. Um, but, yeah, he was not, like, a, I want everybody in my business kind of person, it seems, like you said. I'm going to research that one. Please Even do. though it's not my business, I'm still going to research it. <laughs> no, please do. I will send you, um, I'll send you, like, what I used to research this and then for all of the listeners it will also be in the blog post at for today's episode the awesome. sources perfect yeah okay last one you ready yeah eleanor roosevelt <gasps> what yeah the first lady of the united states and her husband president franklin delano roosevelt had an arrangement. He could do what he pleased, and so could she. So she chose reporter, reporter, reporter Lorena Hickok, who actually quit her job at the Associated Press because she felt that her closeness to Eleanor compromised her ability to objectively report on the family. Few, a few years after Lorena quit her job, she was named the executive secretary for the Democratic National Convention. So she moved into the White House where Eleanor and FDR lived, in case you missed that. My mind is blown right now. Blown. Blown. And then after Eleanor Roosevelt died, the family destroyed almost all of the letters and any of that that would have proved her sexuality. But somehow a few were preserved. And there's this one from 1933 where Eleanor wrote to Lorena, I want to put my arms around you. I ache to hold you close. Your ring is a great comfort to me. I look at it and think she does love me or I wouldn't be wearing it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like tears. Oh, that's how so stinking tears cute. To my eyes. I oh. I was going to say we love a forbidden love, but it's not that forbidden if you guys are living under the same roof. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Like, I guess FDR was just like, all right, I'll make it easier for y'all to sneak around, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, I, I reckon. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, how crazy is that? I'm here for it either way. I'm oh, yeah. Oh, I'm super here for it. And also, it reminds me, there were, well, there have been rumors for a long time. And truly, I don't know how true they are. Don't. I don't speculate on this because I really, I don't care, but it very much reminds me of some rumors that Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton had the same kind of situation going on where Bill could do whatever he wanted, obviously, and Hillary could do whatever she wanted. And the rumor was that she was a lesbian or bi or whatever. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't, I mean, like I said, I don't speculate on that one. I don't really care. Um, but very interesting that they're reminiscent of one another in that way. They are. That is, I don't even know what to do with all that. I'm just like, how did I not know all of it? Well, because it's not something that's, like, openly talked about, I guess. Yeah. In like, mainstream culture, but... Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was a lot. There was a lot of like good ones in there too. And some yeah, there like, were. some really cute ones. 
can I mention a couple of things while we're on the topic of kind of like historic figures? And... Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, I just wanted to um, kind of give a memorial um, statement, I guess you could say, for Marsha P. Johnson. I don't know if you're familiar with yes. her, but um, yeah, she's, for those who aren't familiar, she's a um, black transgender woman. Um, and she was like monumental in the um, gay liberation movement. And I mean, she was just amazing. I mean, she pretty much just gave a middle finger to anyone who tried to stop her. I mean, she was like, she did AIDS activist work. Um, she fought for LGBTQ plus rights. Um, and she, I think her, like, thing that she's most known for is she threw the first brick at the um, Stonewall riots. So yep. that is, um, just with Pride Month coming up, I don't feel like she gets as much, um, I don't want to say media, but, like, Recognition. respect and attention yes. Yes, that she deserves. Because she was such a monumental um, figure in fighting for our rights. Um, so I just wanted to mention her because she's amazing. And they, I did not know this until I was like kind of reading up on um, all of her accomplishments. Like there's a new documentary out about her. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, because it's, so it, her body was found in the Hudson River, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And they think that it probably was some sort of foul play. So I think that, there's, I want to say, I don't want to get this wrong, but I think the name of the documentary is The Life and Death of um, Marsha Johnson. Um, I'll have to look and I'll send it to you. But okay, that perfect. is, I think it, yeah, I think that highlights like her life and then like kind of speculates what happened um, with her death. So pretty cool. And Demi Lovato came out as non-binary. I know probably most people heard that, but um they use they them pronouns now so i just think that that's really cool and i think that's really difficult for celebrities who have been like in the eye for so long yeah and have kind of sat in this identity and not felt themselves yes you know and now they've kind of made this you know statement to be who they are and i kind of had a feeling that they identified with some sort of like either being gay or using, you know, different pronouns than she, her. And, you know, it's, it's just been really cool to watch Demi kind of, um, I don't know. Come into herself. Yeah. Over yeah. time. Like, it's just really cool to see. And she's so vocal about... Mm -hmm. Um, social justice in general but she's very supportive of you know trans members of society trans youth um, and just LGBTQIA plus rights it's um, been really cool so just seeing her say hey I'm non-binary these are my pronouns and um, I'd like for you to respect that has just been really awesome to watch so um, good on her that's yeah, for really sure. cool I'm really glad you brought those up. It's like, especially, well, Demi, because that is a current event, but also Marsha P. Johnson, because I actually thought about including her, but she, her name has become, I guess, more recognized in recent years. And I wanted to highlight some names that were either not typically associated or maybe not so well known like oh for sure uh, christina jorgensen and um christina did i say the right name yeah christine jorgensen sorry and you know those but yeah i think absolutely awesome point and definitely send me the name of that documentary and i'll include it in the show notes also so that way people can find it easier Okay, I will. And actually, there's a CNN article that is kind of like the scope of um, 
Marsha P. Johnson's um, career as an activist and um, this one line like kind of cracked me up and I was like yes honey she said uh, it says that's when she adopted the name Marsha P. Johnson the P she told people stood for pay it no mind and I was like okay you got bitch. <laughs> like that's <laughs> we absolutely love to see that so absolutely. I was like I would be friends with her in real life, no doubt about it. Like, pay amazing. it no mind. I pay love it no that. mind. Okay. Okay. We'll mind our own business. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Miss Marsha. Oh my gosh. Well, Sid, it's I've had so much fun doing this with you. Yes, me too. Thank you so much for having me on, and you know, listening to my my antics and oh always it's good to learn a few things too that was um I've definitely tried to get better about you know learning about gay culture and um gay history and rights and legislation and liberation and so it's been really good to to listen and learn and I'll definitely take it with me I hope so. I hope I gave you some interesting things, and I hope I gave the listener some interesting things, and maybe some new perspectives, too, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, do you want to share um, your, like, Instagram or anything? It's okay if you don't. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, my Go ahead and Instagram... plug yourself. Sorry. <laughs> okay, cool. My Instagram is at it's a Citosaurus Rex. Um, please don't find me on Facebook. You're just going to find me arguing with conservatives. Yep. Uh, that's pretty much Elaine and I are both there. So that's, uh, we support each other on Facebook and, um, I make TikToks, but I'm awkward. So if you're, me too. if you happen to stumble upon me on TikTok, if you know me in real life, no, you don't. emotionally equipped enough for people to find me like on tiktok (laughs) on my bullshit like i'm not there's no (laughs) please don't so anyway yeah follow me on instagram if you need support if you just need to have somebody to listen i'm safe to come out to um but i also have lots of resources for um you know workplace violence, domestic violence, things like that. I feel very passionately about those things. So if you need an ear, if you need a shoulder, if you need somebody to get their hands dirty and get in there with you and help you change your situation, like I'm happy to help you. Sid is the best. She really is there for you. She really cares and she has awesome resources. So if you need something like that, I really do highly recommend following her and reaching out to her and just take taking this sweet angel into your life. She's sweet when she oh. likes you. Otherwise, stay away. Otherwise, watch out, probably. But <laughs> no, I like most everybody, I think. so. I think so. Um, yeah, I think so. So um, come be my friend. And thanks again for having me, Elena. Of it's course. It's always a, a pleasure and so much fun talking to you. So much fun talking to you, too. And um, real quick, listeners, make sure that you follow along wherever you get your podcasts. Literally, make sure you subscribe, follow, whatever it tells you to do there. Follow on Instagram at I've Been Thinking Pod. And for any of the resources and links and what's the word, sources for today's episode, those will be on the website, I've Been Thinking Pod.com. And there will be a link to that in the show notes at the bottom like where the description is for today's episode too so yeah thanks for listening guys happy pride and again thank you sid thank you and thanks again guys for listening bye guys bye Hello, you sentient ball of stardust. My name is Casey Davis. I'm a therapist and I'm an author of the book, How to Keep House While Drowning. 
where I talk about ways to make it a little bit easier to take care of yourself when you're overwhelmed, stressed, have mental health issues, physical health issues, or maybe you're just in a hard season of life. Maybe you're looking for a place that you can come and listen to some practical advice. This is a podcast for all of the self-help rejects. We're going to talk about skills for survival and self-kindness. And I'm going to leave the pop psychology at the door. I promise not to tell you to meditate or to journal. We're just going to give you some really insightful conversations with hopefully some practical advice. So I don't believe you need to pick yourself up by the bootstraps. I don't want you to just try harder. And I don't believe that laziness exists. So join me over on Struggle Care, where we can find compassionate solutions that help us function a little bit better. Between aging and busy lifestyles, many women struggle with maintaining their physical and mental wellness. At Aquavita Concierge Healthcare Services for Women, we can help you revitalize your health and reclaim your life. We start from within by balancing your hormones, allowing your body to achieve and maintain desired weight goals. We also specialize in peptide therapies, regenerative medicine, sexual health, and aesthetics in our state-of-the-art facilities. Feel better, look better, live better. At Aquavita, visit aquavitality.com and begin your journey today.